Welcome back. This is week four of the course on inverse methods in heat transfer. And uh, what we will look at in this video, something that I alluded to and even discussed in a mild amount of detail in the first week, which is the general inverse methods process. So, so far in week three and week two, we saw uh, a lot of techniques. Um, primarily, we looked at different ways of looking at linear regression. Now, starting this week, later on, we are going to start doing nonlinear regression also. And later on, we will do machine learning methods as well. But all of them um, come broadly within this process that I call the inverse methods process. In fact, you will see when we come to the machine learning portion that the machine learning uh, method itself is in some sense a subset of the general inverse methods process. Now, what I would like to pay attention, you to pay attention to within this video is to start thinking about how what I am saying within this video makes sense in the context of linear regression, what you learned about linear regression in the last two weeks. And uh, as you go to the nonlinear portions later on this week, also see how it applies there. So once you see the general process, you should be able to fit in practically every method. And I see, I feel that this gives a lot of clarity to what generally happens within uh, inverse methods. Otherwise, we get uh, lost within the details of the methods. Okay. So coming back to this, the inverse methods process generally involves two steps. Okay which we have seen so far really speaking so there is what we will call the forward step and i discussed this earlier as well in the first week and then there is the second step which we can call the feedback step or the inverse step so let's see details of this uh, right now so the first thing is the forward portion we call the modeling portion or the forward modeling portion. Okay. So as you would have seen within the linear regression portions, what you typically have is some X, some Y, and then of course you have your model. This model involves some parameters W. So that's what I have written here. Imagine there is this box. This box essentially is our model. What you have going in is, for example, in the slab and thermocouples example, this would be the slab location. This W would be our guess at the parameters that relate the location to the temperature at that point. So, for example, this model is essentially an educated guess at whatever relationship we have between input and output. Notice that this is still a guess. Now, you might say that the model obtained from physics, but physics is also in some sense a guess. At least that's the viewpoint that I take, but nonetheless, it's an educated guess. Could be physics. As I have written here, this educated guess may come from physics or it may be a purely data-driven approach. And this is what we call a data-driven model. And we'll see this distinction once again, when we come to the end of the course or the machine learning course. This is to be a physics based model. Okay. But either way, whether we got the model from physics or whether we got the model from data, for example, you might remember last week that I showed you that the for the temperature data, um, we could even fit a quadratic and that would be a data driven approach. Whereas physics said that no, it has to be a linear temperature dependence on the sensor data. In fact, we saw that the quadratic fit fit better. But nonetheless, we went with the linear fit because we assume uh, that the physics actually governs uh, this, this what is happening within this lab and not assumed. I mean, I think it is a reasonable assumption to make given the general long history that we have had with how temperature varies within a slab. But uh, based on that, we uh, made a model which was uh, basically y hat equal to w0 plus w1x. This is an example of a model. Of course, you could have other models. So when we make a guess for what the model is, now it is useful to split it into two parts. One is the form of the function. What do I mean by form? 
you can clearly see that a form of the function that looks like w0 plus w1x is different from y hat equal to let's say w0 plus w1x plus w2x square which would be a quadratic function. How are these two different? If you look at geometrically, whatever linear function you give, regardless of what w0 and w1x you give, it will always only look like this. It can only look like straight lines. Whereas a quadratic can look like this. So it can capture more complex data relationships. Okay, so this is what is called the form. Now, quadratic, a special case of a quadratic function is also a linear function because you can simply set w2 equal to 0. So, a quadratic covers linear, but a linear doesn't cover quadratic. Similarly, if I have a sinusoid, even a quadratic cannot be uh, covering sinusoid. So, each function has its own characteristics, which we will call very roughly the form. All of you intuitively understand what that is. Um, parameters of the function are the knobs that we are turning. So W0, W1, W2 decide the details of the function. Now, all these are still lines, but the slopes of the line, how flat they are, how steep they are, all that are the parameters of the function. Okay. So we sometimes use the notation, uh, notice this, y hat, which is of course our model, is a function. This is our model function or called the hypothesis function. x is the input, w is a parameter and in order to distinguish the fact that the form and function, the form and parameters are different, we don't call it x comma w. For example, if I look at this function, you can technically say this is a function of w0, w1, w2, x and x square or w0, w1, w2 and x. But that would be x comma w, but mathematically it's a little bit more clear in order to separate this roles, different roles that a form and a parameter have to say x semicolon w. Okay, So this is a notation that you might find uh, within the literature, especially within machine learning literature. Now what it indicates is this, if you give me x, for example, again please go back to the physical example, if I give you location and I give you the two values w0 and w1, you can obviously find out the corresponding prediction for the temperature. This, this thing that goes from the input to the output or uh, from the independent variable to the dependent variable is called the forward model. Okay? Um, this process is sometimes called feed forward. You will see this. So where, what about the feed forward step? People might ask you stuff like that. So feed forward is going from uh, x and w to finding out y. Now, the exact opposite of this, so please remember this, this is what is called the forward model. Now, the exact opposite direction of this is the inverse process. Okay. Now, how is the inverse process? I am going to actually combine both the forward process and technically speaking, the inverse process is just this or the feedback process. So I'm going to uh, combine both the feed forward and the feedback and make up this entire thing, which is the in inverse process of solution. Now, again, go back to your linear example that you have seen so far in the course. We actually had a data set. The data set looked like this. One, two, three, etc. X was X1, X2, X3. These are the various locations. We went until X6 uh, in our slab example. Then you have your model prediction. Mm, then that is Y hat 1, Y hat 2, etc. Up till Y hat 6. And you had the actual measurement, which is Y1, Y2, Y6. Now the point is this. Suppose I go to location 1 within the slab, I know x1, I already, let us say for some, in some magical way, I have this guess. Okay. Then given a guess and given x1, I can find out y hat. So that's what is written here. First, we collect data pairs. We collect an x, we collect a y for that, x, y for that. Again, if time permits later on in this course, I'll discuss what happens if you don't have some of these data points. Okay, Some of these data points are missing, then what can we do? 
I'm not sure whether we'll have the time. If time permits, we'll look at it within the advanced portions of this course. Okay. But let us say uh, the general problem, the inverse problem is given some locations and the temperature uh, um, measurements on that, find out the parameters. Okay. So what we do for that is the first step, of course, invariably is to collect all these data pairs, temperature, uh, sorry, location, temperature, location, temperature, etc. Then you prescribe, this word is very important, you prescribe a form of the function. Okay. Whether you are doing machine learning later on in this course, you are doing non-linear or you are doing linear, you always prescribe a function um, from physics is what we are going to do within the first portion of this course. So, for example, if you have two variables, you could say w0 plus w1x1 plus w2x2 in case it's a linear dependence on, let's say, uh, both the x and y locations of this point uh, or x1 and x2 locations of this point. Now, note this point. For an arbitrary guess of for w, now it will look like in all our linear regression, we really never guessed for w. Okay? We just wrote our normal equations and derived it. Okay, uh, we just found out a single w. That is just, but just imagine that we were not doing that. Just like uh, linear equations have, uh, I hope some of you have seen this. Uh, linear equations have both direct methods like Gauss elimination and indirect methods like Jacobi, Gauss Seidel, etc. Some of you might have seen these methods. So if you have a set of equations, you can always solve them either directly, that is one shot solution or indirectly or what we would usually call iteratively. That is you take a guess and improve the guess. So now assume we are going to use some such method and in the next few videos, we will start discussing such indirect methods. So let's say we take an arbitrary guess for W. Um, so for some guess of W, we give let's say 0, 0 and uh, you can find out what happens to Y hat okay, for that guess. Now obviously, for an arbitrary guess of W, obviously Y hat is not going to match Y. So they, they are going to be different. Okay, so we define a cost function, which we did last time. We had an objective function saying only that W is good, which minimizes something like the least square value. And till the machine learning portions, we'll be sticking with uh, this kind of cost function. Okay, so you just sum up the gap between Y and Y hat. For an arbitrary guess, obviously, these two are not going to be close. Okay, now... Finally, what we did was we find out the optimal W by minimizing J. And this is what is the feedback process. So you give X, you give W, you use your model. This model usually comes from physics. You say if this was the temperature uh, and if these were the parameters, then uh, sorry, if these were the parameters, then what would be my model prediction? And then you check it against the actual ground truth. And that gives you the difference is measured by the cost. Now, if this difference is too high, I am speaking colloquially here. We will see the actual process the next few videos. The difference is too high, you improve. Okay, so you go back, uh, improve this by some optimization method. So this will require an optimization routine. Now, what we did um, in the previous weeks was our optimization routine was essentially analytical. Okay, so basically we did a theoretical calculation and we came up with the normal equations. Now, as we will see, this normal equations approach works practically only for linear regression. It's still powerful as we saw last time, but this approach works only for linear regression. And even this case, this was a set of linear equations. So we had our set of linear equations x transpose x was a matrix times um, z w equal to x transpose y 
this was the right hand side this was the left hand side all this coding we did okay and we solved for w here but in general as we will see uh, later on this week we don't have we don't have a linear system of equations you can probably intuitively see this if you don't that's okay we'll make this explicitly clear uh, later on this week if you don't have a linear model if the model itself is not linear in w okay if this model is not linear in w then this equation will not be a linear equation for w that might seem obvious if not like i said we will discuss this so this is linear equation w or a linear system of equations in w what we will see in general is we will get a non linear system of equations in w and we don't have a simple process of solving it analytically which is why we will have to solve it numerically by iteration so the way we are going to build this numerical uh, solution by iteration is as follows um i'll first show you a non linear problem in the next video and after that we will systematically first solve this uh, linear system or actually speaking the linear model we will try to solve it by iteration pretending as if we don't actually have an analytical solution and then after that slowly we will build up uh, how to solve the non linear equations okay so finally we will end up with something called a gauss newton algorithm you will see the name of gauss coming everywhere you saw gauss elimination gauss seidel and the algorithm that we will finally discuss at the end of this week will be called gauss uh, newton algorithm that's the general algorithm that we can use to solve uh, a, a non linear inverse problem okay so i'll see you in the next video where we will discuss uh, why non linear models arise in heat transfer thank you